Welcome to Discovering Gray's Lake, a podcast dedicated to the stories and people that make our town truly unique. Join us as we sit down with local business owners, community leaders, and everyday residents to hear their tales of triumph, struggle, and everything in between. From the little-known historical gems to current events shaping our community, we'll cover it all in an engaging and informative way. I'm your host, David Wool, and together we'll discover the heart and soul of our town, one story at a time. Today's podcast is brought to you by the lovely folks at Keller Williams North Shore West at the Sink Mars Group. Motivated not by numbers, but by helping you feel at home in our community. Jody Sinkmars and her team are committed to serving Grays Lake and its neighbors with the utmost care. Call Jody today at 847-767-7358 or visit the Sinkmars Group online at sinkmarsgroup.com to get started on the path for the home you love right now. This podcast is also brought to you by the Cashmore Financial Group. Financial advice for everyday people. Turn your financial stress into financial success. Call us today, 847-231-6150. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Discovering Gray's Lake. I have the distinct honor to sit down today with Michelle Cox. Hi, how are you doing? I'm awesome. Okay, so I'm going to be um, completely honest. I don't know a ton about you. Which is great. That is good. That is good. Um, but when she did walk in, I told um, a young lady that's sitting here where we're recording that you were coming in, and she's a fan, and she's read your books, Ooh. and she was excited to meet you. That's awesome. Yes. Okay, so you're from Gray's Lake, and you're an author. That's that, Let's just start with that. That That's what I know, basically. <laughs> okay, yes. I am from Gray's Lake, and I am an author. Okay, what is your pen name? Is that what they call yeah, it? No, yeah, pen name. Um, no, I just go by Michelle Cox. Okay, so. I didn't know if you had something you wrote under. No, no, just me. Okay. Easier so, to find. How long have you lived in Grace Lake? Oh, gee. Um, let's see. We moved here in probably like 2000, 2002, 2003. Okay. Yeah. It's a long time ago. Yeah, we had a four-year stint where we lived in Michigan. Okay. My husband was transferred, and then we came right back, so... Came yeah. right back. Came right back. That's good. Okay, so at what point in your life when do you go to school for literature? Do you do anything <laughs> like that? Like how how do we sit here today and now you have all of these books that we'll we will talk about, but how do you get start writing? Um that's a good question. Um I was an English lit major. Okay. But I didn't do anything with it. Um, I originally wanted to be a doctor, so I spent two years of college doing pre med. And then I realized that, you know, I liked it, I enjoyed it, but I just couldn't see myself doing this forever. Okay. So I switched to literature, and um, that was my true secret love. And um, but like I said, I didn't do anything with it. Were you writing at night or anything? Did you no. have a big journal you're writing? No, I don't have any cool stories like that. All oh. I can say is that. I did work in a nursing home right out of college, and I was working first as the admissions director in the city, and I was terrible at it because <laughs> <laughs> I was a just be honest, right? <laughs> I I I didn't realize that part of the job was like being an ambulance chaser, and shut up. Yeah, I was supposed to like schmooze hospital discharge staff to like send people to us, and I just wanted to that be sound very ethical. No, I just <laughs> wanted to be with. Like, you know, it's supposed to be them, like, bagel trays and stuff like that. Right. And I just wanted to be with the residents because they had such cool stories. I bet. Yeah. So, like, I would sit with them and um, just hear, listen to their stories, and I was never in my office. And so, finally, the administrator called me into his office, and I'm like, okay, here, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> right. And he's like, you know, we're going to move you into social service, and now that's your job. And I'm like, oh, yay, that was fantastic. So um, I was one of my duties was to write like interview them when they came in. And I was supposed to write just like a little paragraph about their life. But nobody was watching over my shoulder. So I was sitting with them for like two weeks. Wow. Yeah. Listening to their stories. And I would write these pages and pages and pages um, <clears throat> that I would put in the chart. And no one said, don't do it. And the staff would come up to me and be like, oh, we read your latest. It was great. It was so sad. You I'm like, I know. Their yes, I was writing their stories. Wow. So then I got married and um, started having kids and the, the writing all just 
went to the side. But I was I was always like a really creative person. Yeah. So it was always trying to come out. So it was either decorating the house or gardening or creating these elaborate birthday parties and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> so finally, when my oldest was um, a sophomore in high school, he was diagnosed with um, ADHD, which I know is late. <laughs> And um, anyway, I was doing all this volunteer work and was on all these committees and da, 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 da. And I just said, you know what? I I need to stop. I need to just quit everything. I just need to like focus on him. And then I thought there was something wrong with the next kid. And anyway, um, then I – it wasn't as – this big traumatic thing that I thought it was. I realized I was kind of a knee jerk. Right. And that happens to a lot of us parents like that. Right, right. I'm sure a lot of people listening can relate with that. Yeah. But then I had this big chunk of time. So I'm like, you know, you can go back to doing what you were doing. You could go get a real job. Or maybe you should write the novel that you always wanted to write. And I'm like, I think it's time. So like four different people from four different um, friend groups just randomly came up to me and said, I think you should write a book. At the same time you're yeah, thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. I'm uh, like, okay. <laughs> uh -huh. How everything just comes to right, kind of right. plays right yes. together, right? Okay. So what, during all the stuff where it sounds like you're a lot like me, where you're just sitting around doing things and your creativity is just trying to like you know, ooze out of you, but it comes out in different ways until you can channel it into what you really think you yes, should do. Yes, exactly. I haven't figured out what I'm going to do yet. <laughs> <laughs> if I grow up, we'll figure that one out. You'll get there. So when you thought first about writing a novel, yeah, what, what, what was the idea? Did you know what you wanted to write when you first? Well, I went back to all of those stories. Awesome. Yeah, and I pulled one that I really loved, and I tweaked it into sort of a coming-of-age novel. And, you know, nobody wants to think about their first novel as your practice novel. People say that. Okay. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> but it was. It was your practice It novel. was my practice. I tried really hard to get it published um, for like a year. And uh, for uh, let me just back up a step, because first of all, it, it was never my intention to publish a book. I know it sounds fake, but r for real, I just wanted to see if I could sit in a chair long enough <laughs> to produce a novel. Like, it was a challenge. Like, can I do it? I bet it was a huge challenge. It was. It took about a year. And um, after a I... A year? Yeah. It took like, about how a year. much are you writing a day in a year? You know, back then I was writing just when my youngest was taking naps. Okay. So not a lot. I didn't know how, how much you're sitting there <laughs> during the day doing it. No, just when I had, you know, bits of time. And now I do it full time, but then it was just whenever I could work it in. So, um, yeah, I... I forgot where I was going with this. Yeah, so you were right. I'm sorry, you you were writing for over a year. We're talking okay, right. So I gave it to friends and family. Okay. And um, they're all like, "This is great. You should publish this." I'm like, "Well, that wasn't really the goal. I have I know nothing about publishing. Nothing." Right. And they're like, "Well, you should try. You know." And so being so naive back then, I'm like, "Oh, okay." So then <laughs> I re sounds easy, right? right? I researched all of that and I started trying to do it and spent about a year. And I'm like, you know what? There, I'm either either something wrong with the product or there's something wrong with the process. And so I went to a conference in New York and realized that it was probably both. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided, you know what, I'm going to start over. And that was the beginning of the Henrietta and Inspector Howard series, which was the first one was A Girl Like You. So that's the one that took off. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So when you're writing it, did you think, did you yourself think like, wow, this is good? This is really good. People are going to love this. Um, I I had hoped it. I I did try to write it a little bit more with a market in mind. Okay. So, um, yeah, I and I picked mystery because I felt like that would have more of an appeal to not only the public but to an agent. What year is this? This is. I wrote this back in oh, like probably 2013. Okay, so 10 years ago. Yeah. Wow, time flies, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so you you write that and you get that published, right? Because now you know the process and <laughs> yeah. the product, right? Well. Exactly, right? Yeah. Um, when you do that, do you write the first novel with in mind of this is going to be a, a series or something, or just a standalone? <laughs> I, you know, that's good. That's a great question. Um, 
when I was writing it, I thought that it was a, a one-off. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have picked mystery and I probably <laughs> wouldn't have picked the 30s because I have more of an affinity for the 40s. And that Is this was Chicago in the Chicago, 30s? yeah, Chicago in the 30s. And it, it's because I based Henrietta, who's the main character, on a woman from the nursing home who had this amazing life in the 30s in Chicago. She had all these jobs, that, even though it was a depression. Yeah. And one of them was that she worked at the Chicago World's Fair. And she every day she had to dress wow. up as a Dutch girl for a Dutch rubber company and hand out flyers. And it was her favorite job of, of her gigantic list of jobs because she got to walk around the fair on her lunch hour. So How I'm like, awesome is that? Yeah, I'm like, I really want to put that detail in the book. So I'm like, well, I could set it in the 30s. And then I decided midway to turn it into a series. And I'm like, great, now I'm writing <laughs> a mystery <laughs> series in the 30s. But it turned out okay. Right, because my first question is when you're writing that, I'm like, it'd be fun to write a mystery series. But how do you know what it's like to live in the 30s? Yeah, well... So how do you make it time relevant? Because yeah, you have your research that you yes, did at the nursing home. exactly. Yeah. Wow. Does this woman know? Was no, she alive? No, she's not alive. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. She was probably 80 when I met her, and that was early 90s. Wow. Yeah. But was that her name as well? No. No, you did it. You yeah. made up the name for yeah. that. Yes. Um, because I find it interesting, like especially writing like a first novel. Like if I were to sit down and write a book, you know, usually any project you do, you think of having, you know, beginning, middle and end, but it'd be a really interesting process to go. At what point do you decide, Oh my gosh, there's so much content to go here that it can't end here. Or you have to leave a, leave an out. Right. Or leave well, an opening. yeah. I mean, but for me, it was the characters. I just really started to kind of fall in love with them because it's weird though, because when I first started writing the book, I was still super attached to my characters from the first book that failed. Oh, okay. And I was just sort of, you know, writing them, not really caring that much about them. And then finally, like midway through the book, I'm like, I really like these guys. So I, you brought old characters. No, you. I didn't. Oh, you didn't. I created totally new ones for book one. Right. From the, the, the standalone that never got published. Wow. And yeah, I so loved the characters that I thought, you know what, I can't let them go. I have to create a series. So, wow. but had I known I was writing a series, I would have set it up a little bit differently. <laughs> right. So I kind of had to wiggle a little bit in the second book to make it work because I really didn't want to write a whole series about a cop and his wife in Chicago in the thirties. I felt like that had been done before and we're going to get into too much of the mob and that's, you know, we've right. all seen that, done that. Right. So you wanted something different. Right. So this is kind of more of a... It's kind of like a Downton Abbey in, you know, Chicago. So we've got the rare, the really, because part of the books are set in Winneka. So we have the very oh. elite people that lived during the Depression. And then we have the, all the characters that are in Chicago who are living a very different kind of life. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. How hard was it to get that book published? It wasn't, um, it wasn't as hard as the first one because um, when I went to that conference, the Writers Digest conference in New York, uh, one of the first panels I went to was a uh, um, run by an agent, April Eberhardt, and she talked about the three paths to publishing, and I had never heard of that. So I w- mm. went into that one, and she was talking about traditional publishing self-publishing and something in the middle called hybrid and that was really exciting to me i was sitting in the in the class and i'm looking around at everyone like are you guys hearing this This (laughs) you were so excited yeah i was i'm like this is perfect (laughs) so um i actually submitted the the first book the big gargantuan novel that never got published <laughs> right. to them. And there's, they said, no, that, that we can't publish this because they're not a vanity press. They only take about 7% of their submissions. They're so 7%. Yeah. They're so flooded right now that their, their, their list is out until like 2025. Unbelievable. Yeah. And so the great thing about them is you do have to invest in your product. Right. I was going to say, who funds this? You invest in the product, but you make a higher royalty off the back end. And the key really is that you're traditionally distributed. So I'm in bookstores and libraries all over the country and the world. And that's really what you're paying for is to get that distribution. Yeah. Because I... 
I would think it would be hard, first of all, A, to get accepted. So explain to me a little of the difference between, just because I, I want to know for my own thing, hybrid and trad- uh, what are the three kinds of hybrid? Hydra, hybrid, traditional, and self-publishing. And so traditional is like, you know, the big four. Got you. Yeah. So did you did you try that at all? Or you just went you said hybrid is the way that you wanted to go? Well, you know, I I when I went to the conference, I was the newest newbie that ever, ever lived. You know, <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is so exciting. I'm in New York and I'm a writer and all this and Were um, people giggling at you? <laughs> probably. Look at her, she's like, dreaming. <laughs> right. But what I was really surprised by, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm there, I'm excited, I'm like, okay, and everybody was very sour about traditional publishing. Really? Yeah, because, it's, you know, it's even now, it's worse. It's so hard, it's so difficult, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was, you know, really deflated really quickly. Like, oh, gosh, maybe I shouldn't have come. I don't know if I can do this. And so then when I walked in and, and heard about hybrid publishing, I thought, you know what, this is the way to go. I'm not even going, I had written this mystery specifically to appeal to an agent. Right. And in the end, I didn't submit it to a single agent. I'm like, I'm just going this way. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you wrote it with one kind of audience in mind of who you're writing it for, and then you go a different way. Right. So Interesting. But it was great. Yeah. Okay. So that process. So you, you get that done. Okay. Here's here's my question. I'm just trying to wrap my head around. <laughs> so I'm just trying to think of myself writing a book, not knowing if it's going to be published or not, um, but you're making it into a series. So you obviously believed in your dream of doing this a lot, especially if you were, were you already writing a second book before you got the first one published? No, because I had written it relatively quickly and I was still hanging on to the dream that this um, first book was going to get published. So A Girl Like You, which is the first book of the series, was kind of my backup. Okay. And so then the backup ended up being the number one. And then while that was in the in the process of being published, I wrote the second one. And I wrote that one in 68 days. 68 days. Yeah, the first draft. So you so you knew what you were doing. You know, you you yes. like really knew like where you were going. Yeah, because I had kind of left the first one a little bit hanging and I really knew where I was going with the second one. And plus I was trying to shift the series a little bit into more what I wanted. So I knew exactly what I wanted to have happen. Gotcha. So the first three books are almost like their own little trilogy. All right. And then after that, I am like, Oh, I don't know really where to go with this now. And so I felt like they were veering off a little bit too much into romance. And so Books four, five, six, seven are are more solidly how many mystery. Books? Okay, so maybe we should tell everybody right. So how many books have you written? How it, many books have you published? I should say six. Six are published in the series. The seventh and final comes out this October. This October. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How exciting is that? Yeah. Okay, so have you seen? Um, because of the story about me, so I help try to sell a book for a gentleman. That's one of my things is marketing the book, which marketing a oh. book to sell in 2023 <laughs> is insane. Isn't it? It is so hard to do. It's really the hard. The market is flooded. And if you don't have, you already have a following and to try to actually drop something right now and get it out there, it has to be either somebody I, I think that's famous or, mm-hmm. or has something or it has to be extremely extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's over a million books published every year, a million. So that a million books, a million. So probably, to stand out, it's really hard. Right, and probably at a time where people are reading the least amount of books, <laughs> we have the most amount of books coming out. Right, doesn't sound like a good business plan. I know, me. right? I should rethink. <laughs> it's crazy. So, did you see your book sales like? Um, when you're looking at like book number one, um, could you see that you had a following and it would build on each one that you did? Yeah, for sure. Um, book one is hard to top though, because I, I got a lot of, um, kind of heavy hitter awards on that one oh, before it came tell, out. Please do tell what, what kind of awards I won the Ippy and I won the next gen, which this is not going to mean anything to anybody, but, um, you should see the smile on her face. <laughs> you should be proud of yourself. And I got two starred reviews from, um, library journal and book list. Okay. And so I think all of that comboed, I sold out my print run, even though it was very small. I sold it out before I even 
published the book. So how awesome is yeah, that? Yeah, that was cool. Is that just because people had reviewed it and said this is? Yeah, because the librarians buy based on Library Journal and Booklist, uh, and so because it had come out and gotten a starred review, you sold out before. Yeah. I, wow. So what did you do? Did you make more? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> I would be like sure, on yeah. the phone going, "We need to print more now." Yeah. Well, my publisher called me and she's like, "You know, we have a problem." I'm like, "Oh God." I like problems like that. It's like a few days before publication, and I'm like, "What?" She's like, "Well, it it's good and bad." Um, the the bad thing is that we've sold out your your print run, but the the, the good thing is we've sold out your print run. Right. So. The bad thing is we need to print more. <laughs> yeah. And how fast can fast. we print them? Yeah, they they turned it around in a couple of days, but they had to do oh, wow. print on demand to just quickly get some into stock. So that was more so, costly, I'm right, sure. Right before, so that they they could do a big print run again. Wow. Yeah. That's really. cool. It was a crazy ride. Wow, and how exciting, especially yeah. to see like your just your dream from. So it sounds like your your real love is that first book, though. Yeah. Where yeah. is it? What is it? Was it? Is that published? Oh, this one? Yeah, not anymore. Not I mean, anymore. people, friends that read it still say to me, you know, we, we still remember that book and oh. we would love you to publish it. And I said, I've learned so much since then. Can you rewrite it? I would have to either rewrite it, but another thing is I stole a lot of characters. Oh. Well, like, not the main work. ones, but... Right. So, we'll see. Okay, so that series, so there's six books and seventh one coming out in October. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so is that, do you have any other things that you're publishing besides books? It sounds like you're, um, <laughs> <laughs> you seem like a very busy, I can already see your, your head working now probably yeah. on the next thing you're going to write. Well, I do have a standalone women's uh, historical coming out in February. Cool. Yeah. Called the fallen woman's daughter. So that's kind of a, that's what? another story based on uh, a nursing home story. And what genre is that? It's like, um, like women's fiction, historical. Okay. So, yeah, that's... It's a kind of different step to take. Right? Yeah, well, uh, th- th- I'm hoping that my fans will, you know, like it because it's it's also historical and kind of in that same vein. Right. So, um, yeah, so I'm really excited about that. And then I'm writing a, a spinoff series awesome. um, based on one of the characters from the Henry and Anne Clive series. And um, then at some point, I'd really love to start a, a fantasy, a historical fantasy about a World War One nurse that finds this strange um, man on the battlefield. Wow. And he's actually from medieval times. So. I like to see your inside your mind when you lay down in bed at night. <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely swirling. It's trying to stop things when you have. And it's probably hard to say, okay, I'm going to work on this one. Especially when you have other ideas that keep coming in. I'm pretty disciplined, so I'm pretty focused. Like I, it's one book at a time. So, but it's really hard you. right now because I'm, you know, trying to do the the pre launch for book seven, right. finish finishing up, you know, the the fallen woman's daughter, and currently writing the series. But wow, there's so much, you know. I think we we were talking about this before. There's so much that you could do. I mean, I'd love to write an audio drama. Yeah, I have audio books for oh, yeah. all of the series. So those are all available. On those audio are all too. available. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess this would be a good time to to tell people. A, my first question would be, I live in Gray's Lake. Is there somewhere I can pick up a hard copy of your book? <laughs> well, yes, Dave. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> can we see that from where we're sitting? Yes, it's right across the street. Yeah, definitely go to this old book in Gray's Lake. They have all the books. And a lot of times, um, Jeanette has copies of the new book coming out before you can get it even on Amazon. So, No kidding. Yeah. Hot tip. Yes. Hot tip. And if somebody um, were wanting to do the audio version, is it everywhere? Audible, Apple, everywhere? Yeah, everywhere. Um, Spotify. And um, and also, I just want to put in a plug for libraries. It, it All the books are at the Grays Lake Library, so you can definitely go there. Oh, nice. Yeah, and if it's if, if they don't have the copy you're looking for, they can definitely get it. So. Awesome. Okay, I have a question because I got to read an audio book. Did you record your own audio book? No, gosh. You no. hired somebody to do it. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a real pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it's not your writing. Yeah. See, because I think that a lot of people like it in their own voice. So how did you go about finding somebody to do that? Did you do that? Did your publisher do that? I did it. So um, that's one thing that She Writes Press, is, that's the publisher I'm with, they, they don't do audio. So if you want to do audio, you're on your own. Right. So um, 
I went into ACX first mm-hmm. and looked to. I have demos on there, by the way. <laughs> Ooh, there you go. I looked through their pool of narrators, yeah. and um, I was looking for somebody who could do an English accent because I knew the, they eventually go to England, and my husband is British, so you can't really fool me. Right. So I was listening to all these auditions, and it was just going terribly. <laughs> So much so that I thought about just pulling the project. And then I went into the back end of ACX. I don't know how I found my way there. And I don't even know the back end of that. I'm (laughs) learning so much. I'm learning so much. I want to be on the back end of that. There was like a whole list of narrators. And I found this um, British woman living in L.A. And she had all these sample commercials that she had done. And she was perfect. So I contacted her. And she's like, no, I'm sorry. I just had a baby. I'm not doing it. I'm, I was devastated. I'm like, no. I finally found one. Right. But then I'm like, wait a minute. If there's one, there's another. Of course. So I ended up finding Jean Entwistle, who is a an actress, a stand-up comedian. She's been in, like, The Good Place. She's really? been in all kinds of sitcoms. Yeah. So she also does audiobooks. I mean, that's a huge part of her her business she does about a hundred a year oh she's my god very award-winning so i contracted with her and she's done the whole series for me how cool because you got to have the same person do it oh yeah. yeah wow okay so weird question um do you sell more hardcover or audiobooks i sell more ebooks oh yeah interesting definitely, definitely sell more ebooks so ebooks first then hardcover then audio are they pretty equal? Uh, no, I think you're right. It, well, probably print and audio are probably around equal. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because I always look at the, how the times have changed, especially being on a project to try to try to sell a book. That <laughs> it's um, it's hard to find the way that people consume content these days. I mean, yes. look at what we're doing right now. Right. Right. I mean, and ten years ago, when you published your first book, things were completely different 10 years ago so not only your your writing but your distribution of everything has to adapt to the times right yeah and you definitely your marketing does because yeah. something that worked back then doesn't really work now and you know it, you're always having to sort of try to stay one step ahead and that's tough yeah yeah because the amazon um sales and even every other place that you know sells stuff it's it's amazing to get and the sales ranks on there especially if you think about sales ranks and there's a million <laughs> new books that come out a year yeah it's kind of depressing to look it's sometimes scary. you go i'm rocking it but i'm still number blah 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 whatever um yeah but, but okay so now you did the hybrid publishing for your new books are you going to self-publish? Are you going to... Yeah, good question. Yeah, I'm definitely... I'm self-publishing. So The Fallen Woman's Daughter is going to be my self-publishing guinea pig. Wow. Yeah. So self-publishing means you have to do everything yourself. Yeah. You have to fund it 100%. Yeah. And then find... Oh, my gosh. But you know what? The hard part is is the marketing, and I'm already doing that. Right. So. And I guess now you have a little bit better thing on how to get in and you have an established name so if you try to put it in front of people and get it reviewed before it comes out i'm sure they're going to look at yours before they look at somebody they don't know i'm hoping yeah and i'm hoping my current readership will you know give it a try i'm pretty sure that they will and so yeah it's it's good i'm not going into it cold and i already know i know so many people now in the industry so it wasn't tough to find somebody who would do the formatting or the cover or whatever where before when i was just starting out that would have been way too overwhelming for me but yeah. now i'm like eh, I, you know i know enough people right yeah all right well we have to take a, a little break here um and we do something here on the show and i, and I know michelle hasn't listened i like when people say yeah i listened to a little bit of it um, oh, but we no. call this the gray's lake hot seat oh geez and the gray's lake hot seat is brought to us by our friends at barbecue productions in third lake my good friend chris schoenberger um if you're looking for the best barbecue around make sure to go see chris um and you can tell him you've heard about us on here and this is usually the dreaded the the, the dreaded time where i tried to be as appropriate as i could so we try to make it i should see the look on our face right now <laughs> i'm terrified um, <laughs> so i'm going to ask you a series of questions um fast so we're going to rattle them off okay. and you have to answer as fast as you can you can also pass okay okay does that sound fair enough sure all right so i, I try to use different ones for every time anybody that's a loyal listener um to the show so we'll just start it like this uh first one is uh fill in the blank 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 um <laughs> hey bartender can i have a oh definitely um 
know. Like, should I say the real answer the real or make one, one up? Yes. Okay, I'm I'm a weakling. This I is not a fictional podcast. Okay, this is, uh... it's real. Uh, Miller Lite. All right. Uh, your favorite movie? <gasps> oh gosh. Um... One of your favorite. Movies. Okay, one of my favorite movies is. All right, I'm just going to say it. American Dreamer. Wow. It's a really old one. Very nice. Uh, one of your biggest pet peeves. Uh, biggest pet peeve? Probably when people are, are the victim. Mm-hmm. Uh, highest score in bowling? Oh, I don't even know. Probably, I don't know, 120. Uh, last show that you binge watched? <gasps> oh, that's easy. Um, does that include what we're watching now? Sure, yeah. Battlestar Galactica. Wow. <laughs> I know. I we're ruled had. by our kids. <laughs> uh, are you an early bird or night owl? In my heart, I'm a night owl, but um, I have to be an early bird. With the real world, yes. Yeah. Uh, what's your go-to karaoke song? None. I hate karaoke. Really? Are you a high fives, uh, a knuckles, or a hugs gal? Hugs. Um, tell me about the second time you got arrested. <laughs> Just skip that one. Um, are you a? Uh, what is your favorite season? Fall. Nice. Does your car have a nickname? Bessie. Oh, see, I like that you had that right away. <laughs> this is my favorite question because it's so important uh, to our community. How many days in a in a row can you wear the pair, same pair of jeans without washing them? For real? Yeah. I don't know. Six months. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having more fun as this goes on. Um, what's your guilty pleasure? Ooh, my guilty pleasure. Mm-hmm-hmm. Probably rewatching Downton Abbey. All right. Um, great one for you. What is your favorite book? Oh, boy. Um, great Expectations. Yeah. It wasn't really what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did not plan that, by the way. Um, name a celebrity that you've met. Oh. Um, I met Dustin Hoffman. Awesome. Um, what's the last thing you purchased on Amazon? <laughs> I just purchased um, an umbrella for our deck patio. Nice. And your favorite musical band? Oh, geez. Well, I should say the, the Beatles because my husband's from Liverpool, but I'll say Delamitri. Nice. All right. We're going to stop right there. I like doing these because it makes people um, learn a little Thanks. bit more about yeah. you. And I did skip a couple for you, too, because my favorite question on here is what makes you sweaty? <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we did. see you always find a way to get that in there. Um, thank you for, for, for playing with me. Yeah. I thought you were going to ask me, like, my favorite Grays Lake restaurant. I'm like, oh, God, which one should I say? See, I used to do that, but now it's hard because I go to all of them. I, I know. Uh, we do, too. I go up and down. Like, I just got back from... Emails, but the next day might be the first draft. That's right. And if Abel's was open during the day, it would be Abel's. I know. We've recently we become should... Abel's fans. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Should be like favorite cocktail to have at each each restaurant. Yes. See, because yeah. there's so many places. So you guys obviously, so you live in Grace Lake for a long time. So you obviously eat local. Up and down yes. The road here. Yeah, for sure. And then um, we also love Libertyville too. Restaurants are great. Yeah, you can't, and it's right around the corner too. Um, so your kids now, do they go to high school, grade school here? They went to um, St. Gilbert. Hey, I went to St. Gilbert. Oh. Yeah, nine and, million years ago. You're right. Yeah. And then um, they went to Grace Lake Central. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But we have our our last one is um, going to be a senior next year. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wow, that's that's cool. I got two kids over there right now. Yeah. Or they better be there right now. Yeah. I, 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 well, they're getting out early, so. Oh, this is true. Yeah. I hope they're going <laughs> to hope they'll find an empty home for me to be in. Um, okay, so we have some exciting things coming up. We have your new book in, um, but I want to encourage everybody to to get over and get your book at, at which where where do they start? What do they, what do they get first? Get a girl know. like you. A girl, a girl like, like you. you, yeah. Okay, so that's what you suggest. Yeah, book one. How about this? I'm going to leave a... How much is the book? Over there, I think it's $5 at this old book. Okay, so I'm going to leave five certificates over there for the first five people that go over oh to get gosh. the book. Wow. We'll walk over there before we leave, and Thanks. then you can introduce me to her, too. So that way we'll, we'll have a little thing over there. So if you're listening to this, be one of the first five people to go over there, um, and we will give... Um, those books away. This portion of the podcast is brought to you by JDL Consulting. Jordan helps organizations find their voice, but first he listens. Jordan is a certified nonprofit board consultant with 15 years of experience in the nonprofit sector. 
So speaking of finding your voice, thank you again, Jordan, by the way. So if you've listened to the podcast before, uh, this is time for the Squatch Watch. And this is where you listen to what Sasquatch says. You run over to Facebook, Instagram, and write the Sasquatch phrase of the day. I know I'm a dork, a little uh, Squatch fetish, but uh, what are you going to do about it? So uh, once again, this is brought to you by JDL Consulting. And the Squatch Watch phrase of the day is... My favorite author is Michelle Cox. Yeah, pretty clever, huh? So, hey, be one of the first five people to write on our Facebook or our Instagram, and you get a free copy of Michelle's new book, and autographed as well, that can be picked up at this old book. So run over to Facebook, Instagram, write that down now, and we'll see you soon. All right, so once again, um, the Squatch Watch. Make sure to write that down and then head over to this old book, um, and we'll let you know when the first five people are, and you can pick up your autographed copy. Um Okay, Michelle. I want to know some other things you do besides um, besides writing. It sounds like this engulfs like your entire life. Like pretty, you're pretty much just yeah. writing, 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 writing. Um, support from the community. Um, it sounds like you're kind of our, our little uh, local uh, author <laughs> celebrity here. It's kind of fun. Yeah, it is fun. Yeah, and it's it's great. Like like when I said before, when you walk in and the gal here, Kelly, is a, is a fan of your work. So that's it must be a nice feeling. It is nice feeling. Yeah. So do people um, like all of your friends? Do they read their books? Have you, has your husband read all your books? He has. Yeah. Wow, that's good. I know. Because that could go one way or the other. I know, right? Yeah. No, he he enjoys them. Who is your biggest critic? Is it yourself? Do you have uh, friends that, that look <laughs> at everything and say, um, to either encourage you to, to do better or say, oh, I don't like Well, I have a little um, beta team uh-huh. that reads for me before it goes even out to editing. And I have one. I, I always say that I need to get new beta readers because. Because they've read everything else? Because I can predict what they're going to say. Uh Based on their personality. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. But I can't fire them at this point. I mean, I would have to just like get new ones <laughs> and add them to the team. But there's one guy in particular who is a super old friend. I mean, we've known each other since we were 20. And he is extremely critical. Really? Extremely critical. And it's great because... I'll give the book to the the rest of the team and they'll read it and we'll talk about it on the phone for, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes. Right. Like, I really liked it. This was what it, and I'll ask some questions. But with him, we'll, we'll spend hours, really? hours dissecting it. Wow. And then you make adjustments from there on what you decide you want to change. Yeah. Some, some things I don't listen to him because I know. Right. Whatever. Well, and you know how you want it too. <laughs> right. Exactly. At the end of the day, it's yours. If two or more people have the same concern, then that's a flag for me. Interesting. Yeah, it must be kind of a cool thing. So tell me about the feeling it, it's like when you've gone through this whole process and like it's it's probably not even the day it goes for sale. It's probably when you send the, the to get printed and everything's done. Yeah, it's that it's that final. Um, well, when with she writes press, yeah, it's like you get so many back and forths, right? And then it's you know you have to give the final sign off, and that's it. And then it goes to the printer, and that's that. Wow. Yeah. So when you're talking about the other review thing, so before you have that, does that go to them after you have your final final? thing does that go to get reviewed or do you send like a something to them to have to you mean to my beta team yeah yeah or so, uh, the people that review it like like you were talking about before the awards you've won like oh to, yeah stuff. like after after it's it's finalized okay because you want it to be in its best shape possible right so you hand that in today when does the book come out then do you get to decide on that launch date or how long is the turnaround between the time you turn in you say right, it's done it's good to go before the time hits the shelves um well let's see i'm just doing that now and it's going to hit the shelves at the end of october so okay but the the if you're with she writes press or it you it's a year from the time you submit until wow. the time it's actually published, which is another advantage of self-publishing is I can turn things around much faster. Right. So that process from start to finish, from starting to write it to no. back and forth with your beta team, and then another year after, yeah. so after you're done is a whole other year. Right, but I, I can pretty much... I mean, some of the books of the series took me 
longer because I was getting more heavily into marketing. And so I was a little bit more bogged down. So some of the books took a, like a year to write, but if I'm really pushing it, I can write a first draft in three months wow. and then take three months to edit it myself and then start showing it to early the betas. And then I have to get different editors on board and stuff like that. So. Wow. Has there been any one of these in the series that was much harder than the other one? I, you know, I probably book four was the hardest one because I was coming off of that little kind of trilogy right. and I needed to think about what am I doing with the series? And I wanted to make it more heavily a mystery. And um, so it was kind of hard to get my head around because it was more of a, a strategy thing. So, okay. So after book six comes out, is it over or does it go further from there? Book seven? Book seven. I'm no, sorry. that's it. That's it. Unless th- one of the ideas I have. <laughs> yes, it's over. Unless. Not really. No, it's over with, with she writes and, and there's, n- there's no bad blood or anything like that, but um, it's, I wanted to take the series out on my own and they convinced me to stay with them for book six and seven. Right. Um, and there's an issue with the covers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I might just kind of let that lie for a little bit and then pick the series back up on my own and, but advance it by 10 years. Oh, cool. So now it's the forties and we revisit where all the characters are. So. Maybe, but I've got a lot of other things to write. Wow. You know, actually, one of the questions in um, my hot seat things were, would you rather live in 1930 or 2030? Oh, 1930. I know. Why? Why would you be your main answer? I, You know, I just, I feel such an affinity to that that era. I can't explain it. I don't know if I, like, live there in a different life or something, but the music and um, just that sort of, People trying, having to sort of band together during the Depression and then also the war. It was just, to me, it feels like it was a different world. And I'm sure if you really lived there, you would have a different opinion. But I'm sure it was a completely different world. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for, for spending time with me today and sharing your, yeah. your books. And hopefully, so. everybody that's listening will get over and pick one up. <laughs> or listen to it or get the ebook or whatever. But if we have it local, let's let's do it local. Yeah, great. And speaking of local, so the way I like to end everything, if you would like to give me um, two to three suggestions of some people in town that you think would be great on the podcast um, that maybe we can highlight, whether it's a business, whether it's somebody giving back to the community, um, somebody um, that's very interesting, obviously. Um, any ideas? Oh, right now? Like a nomination, <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. That's a really tough one. I like to spring things on you. Yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> um, well, um, well, I would have to for sure say Jeanette Elliott, the owner of this whole book, because she's such a champion of local authors. That's great. Yeah. So even though it's it's technically a used bookstore, she has new books for all local authors. So, I mean, she's just a great support of the community. So I would definitely say her. And then also Z Laxon, who is an, also an author and photographer here in town. You should awesome. check her out. Awesome. And I know, I, you know, I know who both of the, both who they are, but I don't know their stories. So there you go. I'll do my best to get everything on there and we can, um, and give them some uh, an opportunity to tell their story to the community. Perfect. So, thank you again so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you for listening to another episode of Discovering Gray's Lake. Do not forget to do the Squatch Watch and write that on there um, and get over and get your, uh, I'm giving five free copies of Michelle's book away. And they're autographed. And we're going to make it six because she's given me one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day, everybody.